thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Caitlin Southwick. I am the founder and CEO at Key Futures and Key Culture. And um, today we're going to be talking about culture and, and the climate crisis. Um, so what we're going to do today is this is really an interactive discussion. Uh, what we what we wanted to accomplish with this workshop was really to create a safe space to expand our minds a little bit and debrief and talk through some of the really challenging uh, obstacles that we're facing right now as the cultural sector and as humanity. So over the course of the next hour and a half, we are going to take some deep dives into various topics. Um, I will start off with a 30-minute presentation. I am going to propose several topics to you all, and then um, I would like to invite us all to join a breakout session to dive further into the specific topic. And um, I have moderators here to help me out. So uh, we have uh, Lorena, Marco, and Ava, who are going to be helping out in the moderating sessions. And then um, after we spend some time in our breakout sessions, we'll come back together and do a little debriefing. So I'll talk a little bit more about the logistics and how all of that works uh, when, we, when we start the breakout sessions. Um, before we get started, just a couple of quick notes. As I mentioned, I will be starting with a presentation. So feel free to keep your cameras off while I'm presenting. That's uh, you know not the most interactive part. Um, but we would love to invite you to turn your cameras on and join the discussion during the breakout sessions. Um, we did want to keep a small audience today so that people really had the opportunity to speak up and share. Um, however, of course, this is a safe space. If for some reason you do not want to participate or do not feel comfortable participating, um, please leave your camera off and then we'll know that we can't call on you or that you will not be actively joining the discussion. Um, but of course, this is uh, this is hopefully a place that you feel comfortable talking and speaking. So um, I will go ahead and start with my presentation. Does anyone have any questions before we get rolling here? Probably not yet. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we'll dive right in. And then, of course, as questions come up, we'll we'll have plenty of time to unpack all of these things. You guys can all see my screen okay? Perfect. Wonderful. So this is the second workshop in a sustainability workshop series that Europeana is hosting. So really very grateful to be back um, after our introductory workshop where we examined what sustainability was and why it's important for the cultural sector to care. Um, in the first session, we were looking at sustainability in a more holistic sense. So not just climate, but also social sustainability. We delved into operational and uh, economic sustainability as well. But today we really wanted to focus on the climate. So today's workshop is called Climate in Action. And we're going to be examining some of the nuanced themes around the climate crisis and then opening up space for discussions. Um, I will continue to remind you all that there are no wrong answers. There are no bad uh, statements or choices or decisions. This is um, this is really a, a place to unpack our own feelings about this because sometimes these things can be a little bit complicated and it's important for us to, um, yeah, be able to think about these things out loud with colleagues and uh, kind of express ourselves in a way that gives better understanding of how we see the climate crisis and also what we can do about it. So I've been using this word, the climate crisis, and I wanted to just talk a little bit about when this became a crisis. Um, we talked, uh, we, we've talked for a long time about climate change, um, that the terminology keeps changing. First, it was global warming, and then it went to climate change, and now it's the climate crisis. And of course, this all started with the uh, inconvenient truth from Al Gore. And um, over the last 15 years, it's um, become more and more pressing and more and more apparent that this is happening quicker than we thought it was. And the science keeps showing us exactly what's going on, which is that we are putting too many fossil fuels into the atmosphere and we are causing the world's climate to change. Um, and this is now becoming a crisis because it is affecting how we as human beings live on this planet. Um, it's affecting everything from our coffee to our wine, to our homes, to our art and our culture. So this is why this is no longer just climate change and kind of something far off in the distance. This is really something that's happening right now. So 
I, I wanted to just share some images <laughs> that I think are quite provocative. Um, if we're looking at things like plastic, if we're looking at things like um, clothes, and it's it's a lot of times in Western contexts, you don't think about where these things end up. But if you are in Africa or in South America, then a lot of times these things are in your backyard. And the amount of garbage that we are producing and the amount of waste that is just piling up into mountains of old clothes or of plastic bottles, um, all of a sudden has nowhere to go. So this is why this is becoming a crisis is because we've run out of room for all of the waste we produce. Additionally, of course, we're experiencing crises in other, in other areas, including biodiversity loss, and of course, as we know, carbon dioxide um, and methane release. And one of the huge issues uh, that, that is um, most pressing today is the destruction of the Amazon. And we hear about this a lot, but quite often people don't realize just how important the Amazon is. And this is a map of Brazil. And the red areas show the deforestation of the Amazon. And it's really quite shocking when you look at this, um, you know, that's 50% of the Amazon has been depleted to use for agriculture. And if we're thinking about the larger scale of this, the ramifications are just astronomical, not only from the perspective of Brazilians and indigenous communities that live on this land, but on a global scale and how it affects the air that we breathe, how it affects the meat that is, is uh, being produced from this land and um, you know how it affects our culture. In addition, you know, it's it's not just happening in South America. This is a, a really moving story. I was at a conference in London a few weeks ago and they were talking about Ella's Law. And this little girl died from an asthma attack because she lives in a part of London that there's not clean air and breathing in polluted air all the time killed her. And it's it's just absolutely shocking. This is not, you know, something that's far away or, you know, far away from us geographically or far away from us time-wise. This is something that's happening right now in our own backyards. So this is why this is a crisis. And this is why this is something we need to act on right now. As the cultural sector, there have been a lot of interesting responses to this. Um, we've had everything from um, activist movements start uh, showing up in the cultural sector, such as Culture Declares Emergency or Museums for Future. And we've also had activists using culture to express the urgency of the matter. Um, you know, we've seen different uh, activist groups targeting museums. Um, that's one of the things we're going to be unpacking today. So what is our role in all of this? How do we as the cultural sector think about this crisis and how do we start, um, yeah, working with and towards a better future? And this is what I'd like to kind of unpack today. So this is, um, I just wanted to briefly show you guys a couple of graphs that I personally find quite shocking. Um, these are basically graphs of climate change. So this is uh, population growth, for example. I hope you can see my cursor. Um, and if you look between 1950 and 2010, um, it's just astronomically growing. And you can see how all of the emissions from uh, Earth trend systems are uh, reflected in that. So it's really correlated. And the science is there. Um, I'm preaching to the choir here. I know that you guys don't need to be convinced about this. But sometimes for me, like just looking at these graphs, I mean, if you look at the bottom uh, right hand corner here with international tourism, <coughs> excuse me, and you can see how, you know, how exponentially fast that's growing. And then you look at ocean acidification and see how exponentially fast that's growing. We can actually start seeing that these things are interrelated. This is not one versus the other. You know, the ocean doesn't, isn't its own, um, entities separate from the cultural sector, they're all intertwined. And I think this is a really nice visual representation of how that works. There's another term that um, a lot of people are using that I just wanted to mention here, because I thought this was quite, um, for me, it was quite shocking. And this is the Anthropocene. And I'm sure you guys have all heard of the Anthropocene. And I've given you a few links if you'd like to delve deeper into this. But uh, we had a training in our Key Futures program a couple, uh, couple months ago about the Anthropocene. And it's shocking to me that 
humans are having such an impact on the planet in terms of buildings and material usage that we now have left a geological footprint. And that's what the Anthropocene is. It's the, it's humans having a geographical stratigraphy in our earth's layer. And if you look at this picture on the right-hand side of, you know, an, an overpopulated city, all of that building, all of those buildings, all of that construction, all of that cement, that is going to go somewhere eventually. And it's going to go into the layer of the Anthropocene. So it's really quite amazing that we've we've produced so much that we actually now have a, strat a stratigraphic layer in our Earth's crust. So that for me was really um, eye opening to see, you know, why this is something that uh, we should actually be really consider seriously considering. So this is the this is where we're at right now. We are in a place in our society in our world where we're in crisis. We know we're in crisis, but we don't really know what we're doing about this crisis. Um, maybe some of you do. I'm really excited to hear about that. But I wanted to give us an opportunity today to look at some of these topics in 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 more depth and to discuss some of these issues because you know one of the things I always say about sustainability is that we don't really know what it looks like. So it's really difficult for us to have a clear roadmap on, okay, well, here's how we achieve this. So this is why it merits some really serious consideration and discussion. So I'm going to present four different topics today. Um, I'm actually presenting six, but then some of them are going into others. Um, we're going to start off talking about greenwashing and green hushing. I'm sure you all have heard of greenwashing. Uh, if you haven't, no worries. I'll tell you what it is. Um, and But... Many of you may not be as familiar with green hushing, so we're going to learn about that. I'm going to talk a little bit about carbon offsetting, and I always use the quotation marks for offsetting um, because it can be very misleading. We're going to learn about why. We're going to talk a little bit about climate activism in museums and what's going on there. Um, and then, of course, this will be an opportunity for us to delve into uh, deeper discussions during the breakout sessions. And I wanted to also outline just some really practical things that we can do on a daily basis to help reduce our own footprint and um, be more conscientious about our actions and think a little bit about what impact that has. Um, and that brings us to our next topic, which is this idea of individual action versus systems change. And we're going to delve into what these two things are and the idea of agency. And finally, I'd like to open up a discussion about the role of museums and culture in the climate crisis. So what does this look like in terms of um, in terms of what museums can do or are doing and what we should be doing, maybe? What are our responsibilities in this? All right. So as I said, I'm going to be presenting these topics. Um, more or less, I'm just going to be planting some seeds for us. And then I would like to open up for some deeper conversations in the breakout sessions. Um, and this will be an opportunity for us to really dive into these topics and think through what we're doing and what the cultural sector is doing as a whole. So green hushing and greenwashing. Greenwashing, as I'm sure many of you know, is about misinformation. Greenwashing is basically when a company says that something is sustainable, but it's really not. And a lot of times this is intentionally misleading. Um, so there's a malicious intent to this. Uh, a really great example is if you go you go to the store and you buy something and it's got a nice little green label on it that says, oh, we're sustainable. And then you look on the back and realize the only thing sustainable about it is the bottle is made from 5% recycled plastic. So a lot of these labels are not verified. And so it's very easy for companies to claim that a product is sustainable even when it's not which is one of the issues we have with greenwashing. So this is something that we've been aware of for quite some time. Um, you know, Shell is a great example of greenwashing. Um, a lot of the fossil fuel companies are showing what they're doing in renewable energy to kind of distract from what they're doing within the, um, within the fossil fuel sector. So this is kind of the new big topic of greenwashing. Um, and What's interesting, though, of course, is that, you know, in the cultural sector, we're we're not really very prone to greenwashing, which is a wonderful thing. You know, we're not trying to manipulate people into coming to our museum, even though we're not sustainable. But what can happen 
is we can actually start green hushing. So when before we go into green hushing, the dangers of greenwashing, I think one of the biggest problems with it is that people think they're doing the right thing. If you're buying that product because it says it's sustainable, then you think you're you're making a good choice, but you're actually not because this false information leads to false solutions. So it's also, you know, once again, this false information, fake news type of thing, and it perpetuates myths about what helps the planet. I always like to show this um, triangle arrow thing as an example. This is one of the best greenwashing hacks in the entire history of the world. Um, this symbol you may associate with recycling has nothing to do with recycling. This was created by the, the plastics companies in, I think it was the 1970s. And basically all it does is say what type of plastic it is. It doesn't have any indication on whether it can be recycled or not. I don't know about you, but when I grew up, I looked at that and I thought it meant recycle. So anything that had that on there, I would just throw it in the plastic recycling bin. But actually 9% of plastics today, actually that's not true. 9% of plastics got recycled. That was in 2018. Today, it's down to five. So when we see this label, that does not mean recycling. And this has been one of the biggest hacks because of course, we think that we're doing something good because we're recycling, but actually recycling is not the answer. And this doesn't mean recycling. So this is the dangers of greenwashing. And of course, it allows for these continued unsustainable practices because you think that you're doing something good for the planet. So you buy more of that product, which set has this label on it. So you think you're doing you know, something wonderful. And in fact, um, we're continuing unsustainable practices, not consciously. And of course, as I mentioned, a lot of times it has a malicious intent, but in culture, it doesn't. So I wanted to delve into green hushing then, because as I mentioned, in the cultural sector, we're not very prone to greenwashing, but we can be prone to green hushing. So green hushing is underreporting or not publicizing your sustainability initiatives. And this is something that happens a lot in the cultural sector. I was on the phone with a director at a museum, and I will not mention names because we don't like to shame or blame, but I was talking, this was a few years ago as well. Um, I was talking to this woman and she was saying, oh yeah, you know, we're really into sustainability and we've actually done this and that and the other thing. And we've decreased our carbon footprint by 70%. And I was just ecstatic. I was so excited to hear that. And I thought, that's amazing. Like, can we do a case study on you? Can we publicize this? Like, that's so inspirational. Like museums can save so much energy and like, let's, you know, celebrate this. And they said, oh gosh, no, 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 We're No, we don't, we don't publicize it. We don't, we're just very happy to do our part behind closed doors, but we don't want any attention drawn to this at all. I said, why? And it was for fear of negative backlash because they accepted money from fossil fuel companies. And so they didn't feel that they could talk about their sustainability initiatives because actually what was happening was on the backside, they were taking money from a fossil fuel company. So anytime they would say something about being sustainable, they would get a lot of negative repercussions because people would say, oh, you think you're so sustainable, then you need to divest. So this is where I think the cultural sector has the most danger. So I'm just going to drop that seed in there. Um, a lot of times people think people have said in the sustainability world that green hushing is as dangerous, if not more so than greenwashing. Um, and as I said, the intention there is not malicious. It's usually fear-based. And as I also said, of course, this is something that we can see a lot of in the cultural sector. So one of the questions I'd like to propose to you is how do we avoid this? How do we not green hush? And what can it look like if we are more transparent about our sustainability initiatives and maybe pitfalls? Carbon offsetting is a really interesting term because a lot of people talk about carbon offsetting as a solution for carbon that we can't control. And this is particularly interesting from the point of view of audiences for traveling to institutions. But what I would like to propose today is that instead of using the term carbon offsetting, we start using the term carbon conscious. A lot of times when people talk about um, carbon, going carbon neutral or setting goals. You know, you look at the Paris Agreement, you're, uh, there are a lot of businesses right now that are talking about going net zero um, or going carbon neutral. The problem with that is that net zero or carbon neutral 
generally means that you can use offsets to mitigate your carbon emissions. So what happens here is basically institutions will start by saying that they are going to go carbon neutral and then they will ca- they will calculate their carbon emissions and then they'll say okay well we have x amount of carbon emissions so we'll write a check for 1.3 million euros and call it a day. Going carbon neutral does not necessarily mean a reduction of carbon emissions because it can rely on these offsetting schemes. And we're going to learn a little bit more about these offsets in just a moment. Because one of the problems with these offsets is that they are not usually not very effective. And while there is more regulations on carbon offsetting schemes, it's still something that basically anyone can claim. So I wanted to show you a couple of clips from this really awesome video. I don't know if any of you are familiar with John Oliver. He's a late night uh, TV host in the United States. And he does, um, he did two videos that I find to be incredibly effective for communicating about sustainability. One is on carbon offsets, which we're going to watch a couple of clips on today. And then there's another one on plastics, um, which I send around to everyone because I think it's it's a really clear way of communicating the problem with plastics. But I wanted to um, show you guys a little bit about carbon offsets, what they're supposed to do and what they're actually doing. All right, so if I can get a thumbs up, if you can hear the audio, that would be fantastic. Let's go ahead and watch. The idea of a carbon offset is that if you emit CO2 into the atmosphere, you can offset it by, say, planting or protecting trees, which remove carbon from the air, or building a wind farm to replace a fossil fuel plant. Here is how BP, a major polluter, of course, sells the whole idea. I've been driving around and generating three tonnes of carbon dioxide, which, of course, I've released into the atmosphere to join all the rest of the greenhouse gases that are already up there. Now, imagine that miles away, maybe on the other side of the world, somebody else takes three tonnes of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So, what's happened? Three tonnes in, three tonnes out, result in zero. Now, that violently British man did a pretty... (laughs) So, this is the concept behind carbon offsets. Now let's take a look at the reality. The idea of a carbon... (laughs) Also, the money from offsets doesn't always go to places like the Nature Conservancy. Remember that airport plan where you could offset more than a thousand miles of air travel for just two dollars? Records show that this year a significant portion of the money from that program has gone to support trees at the Hudson Farm Club in New Jersey, a 3,800-acre private hunting club set up by Peter Kellogg, billionaire and model for the L.L. Bean Heart Failure of the Yacht Club collection. (laughs) Here is one member explaining what happens there. Peter had this vision of having a place for uh, several of his friends and additional members to hunt in New Jersey and to shoot in New Jersey and to to, uh, develop one of the best sporting clays spots in in the whole Northeast, if not the country. Uh, It's called Hudson Farm. It's approximately 3,800 acres. It's in Andover, New Jersey. It's one of the most beautiful places on earth I've ever seen. And it is a hunter's and shooter's paradise. Okay, first, it's not just me. We're we're all getting strong get out vibes from that place, (laughs) right? It's not just me. And second, the Hudson Farm Club and the carbon credit company Blue Source claimed that without the money from carbon offsets, 77% of its trees could be clear cut in just five years. But that clearly wasn't going to happen. It's owned by a billionaire and exists for rich guys to fantasize about shooting animals in the water. I don't know about you, but I found that to be quite shocking that a carbon offset program could be set up by a billionaire for his own private estate. Um, That's the problem with carbon offsets. All right. So what we like to propose is instead of talking about carbon offsets, looking at being carbon conscious, which is a three-step process, which looks at measuring emissions. So obviously that's the first part, calculate what the emissions are, being transparent about your impact. And the second and most important part, which is missing from this offsetting, offsetting and going carbon neutral idea, is actively reducing your emissions. We know that we, it's, it's like energy. You know, we can't just rely on offsets or taking carbon out of the atmosphere. We have to stop putting it in in the first place. Because as we saw in those graphs at the beginning of the presentation, 
the rate is increasing so exponentially that even if we offset everything right now, we wouldn't be able to keep our emissions to the place where we can keep the global warming below two degrees Celsius because these emissions uh, or offsets take 10 years to actually sequester the carbon that is put into the atmosphere. And by that time, most of the trees have already been cut down. So this is why we actually have to reduce before we offset. But if you are going to offset, we would like to instead use the term contributing to strategic climate funds. So these are verified funds that actually have an impact in this seven year window we have to save this beautiful planet. So one of the things I like to say, because especially in the cultural sector, we don't usually have money to just throw at projects. So what we can do is actually invest in ourselves, calculate your emissions, see where your biggest impact is, and then invest money in yourself to reduce that footprint in the first place. Win, win, win solutions. So a way that you can talk about being carbon conscious is saying that you're committed to knowing what and calculating your carbon footprint, to acting, meaning to take active measures to reduce the production of carbon dioxide emissions, and contributing positively, either by investing in a certain strategic climate fund or investing in yourself to remove your emissions in the first place. So um, these are just a few things that you can, are a few strategic climate funds, and then also some ideas for carbon insets which I like to use as opposed to offsets. All right, climate activism in museums. I don't think I need to talk very long about this one. Um, I think this is a really hot topic and a really interesting topic. And I'd love for you guys to have a safe space to divulge and discuss. Um, I did a panel session about climate activism in museums uh, a couple months ago, and I found it to be a roller coaster. I was feeling like this, and then I was feeling like this, and I was feeling like this, and then I was feeling like this. It was very all over the place, but that's okay. It's okay to change our minds about these things. It's okay to, um, you know, have mixed emotions. It's these are nuanced topics. So feel free to explore your feelings about these issues in a in a very safe way, and you know, no judgment here. There's no right or wrong, but hopefully, unpacking some of these feelings might give us some ideas about where we stand and how we can talk about these with our colleagues and peers. So as we know, um, there have been several uh, organizations that have been using museums to uh, bring attention to the climate crisis. And we've had some really interesting reactions from, inst from uh, institutions, both internationally and nationally. Um, one thing that I find really interesting is that ICOM International um, put out a statement saying that ICOM wishes to be uh, wishes for museums to be seen as allies in facing the, the climate crisis. And then of course, we also had the statement from ICOM Germany, which talked about how museum directors feel that people are, that this is vandalism. So it's really, there's a broad spectrum here in terms of how people are reacting to this. And I'd love to open up the space to talk a little bit more about it. The other thing that's so interesting, of course, is what is the role of the museum in climate activism? Um, there's an amazing organization, and Ava, who is joining us to moderate this session, um, is a member of Museums for Future. Um, and you know, this is a sister movement to Fridays for Future. And additionally, we have organizations such as Culture Declares Emergency, which is an activist group for culture. And so what is our role as museums in the activism movement? Can we be activists? Can we be spaces for activists? What can we what can we unpack? So this brings me to my next part, which is more the practical aspects. So these are just some tips and tricks about how we can save energy. And I will kind of go through these quickly because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for discussion. But one of the important things that we can think about is what we can actually do. And I think this is also an interesting idea to unpack because what does my action, how does my action actually impact the world? Like, is this, is this making a difference or does it matter because it's just one person and it's a small action? You know, does it matter if I don't bring us, you know, uh, ask for a straw or does it matter if I bring my own silverware? Um, a lot of times we don't know where to begin or what has the most impact. So here are some things that we can start thinking about, you know, 
where do we want to take action? How do we want to make change? And what impacts we can see for that? So um, I, I listed a few different resources here. And once again, happy to share the presentation with everyone. But this is about, you know, how do we how do we actually measure impact? And carbon, we there's a bunch of carbon calculators available, but is that the way to go? Because actually a lot of times there's more nuance to it. There's not, it's not just the carbon emissions. There are other factors that we need to take into consideration, such as accessibility, such as toxicity. Um, I'm an art conservator by training, so that's a big one for me. Um, you know, how is it that we, as the cultural sector, can think nuanced about where we're having impact and what the most impact we can have is? And of course, that also relates to us as individuals. So very, very quickly, I wanted to talk about simple things that you can do today to start saving energy. Um, there's this really interesting thing called phantom energy. Most people don't know this, and I didn't either until I read an article about it in the New York Times. But most appliances continue to consume energy, even if they're turned off, if they are still plugged in. So you can think of like a laptop charger is a really great example of this. My laptop is plugged in right now. I've got the little green light on. If I were to turn my laptop off and keep it plugged in, even though the laptop is on, that little green light is not going anywhere. Most appliances work that way. Even if your coffee maker is off, it's still consuming energy if it's plugged in. So what do we do about this? Unplug your appliances when you're not using them. There are also these really great things, uh, surge protectors or power strips, which have multiple outlets and then a little switch at the end. And you can plug everything in there and then just click the switch and that's off and then it cuts power to everything. So let's, uh, you know, this is a really easy way for us to actually make some change. And thinking about what the impact is, you can buy meter monitors, which are basically little outlets. You plug it into the outlet, then you plug the machine in and it will tell you how much energy the machine is, con is consuming. So you can look at it and see, okay, when it's on, it's consuming this much. When it's off, it's consuming this much. And then I unplug it and obviously it's not consuming anything. So that's actually a really cool way to see how much impact you can have just by unplugging a device. And the other thing I want to remind everyone is, and this is just something I always say because I didn't know this, <laughs> power save mode is not off. Um, photocopiers, computer monitors, laptops, if you don't turn your computer off at the end of the day, it's still consuming energy even if it's in power save mode. The other thing that I always like to bring to people's attention is the overconsumption of in data centers. So data centers are basically, it's the cloud. That's where everything hangs out. That's where your emails are stored. That's where the songs you listen to are. That's where the uh, movies that you're streaming are. And they consume a massive amount of energy. And the more emails you have, the more energy is being consumed. Um, the more tabs you have open, the more websites you're you're opening, the more uh, TV shows you're streaming or songs you're listening to, that's all has a carbon footprint. 2% of global emissions, this is back in 2019, come from the internet. That's the same as the airline industry pre-COVID. So, and, and it's estimated that one fifth or 20% of the world's energy will be consumed by data centers by 2025. Once again, if we go back to those graphs, we can see the exponential growth. I had no idea that an email consumes energy. I had no idea. <laughs> when I found out about this, I looked at my inbox, I had like 20,000 emails. So now once a month, I go through and I delete my old emails. And it's a process, it takes some time, but I know that I'm deleting emails that are otherwise just sucking up energy that's unnecessary. The worst ones are your promotions and social um, inboxes. If you have a Google account, you probably have those. And there's, I mean, I opened mine. I had like 6,000 emails in there that were just all ads. So, you know, delete, 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 delete. Very helpful. Okay. So obviously I've, these are kind of things that we can do as individuals. But once again, looking back at that impact and unpacking and feeling that sense of agency or lack of agency, because sometimes there are things that we just simply cannot do because there are systems in place that don't favor us. Um, an easy example of this is, you know, I, I am based in Amsterdam and there's no composting. And if I want to compost, there's no place for me to throw away my organic waste. So what am I going to do? I'm just going to have to put it in the regular waste because there's no choice for me because the system is in place that prohibits me from doing something sustainable. 
So I want to give you guys some space to unpack this a little bit. What is the impact of the individual versus the system? Does my impact, does what I do really make a difference? And I think this is a, a good image to kind of get the thought process rolling here. Um, so the breakout session for individual action will also talk a little bit about systems change. So we're going to be looking at can the individual affect systems change? How has this happened in the past and how can we affect it right now? All right, finally, and then we'll then we'll get rolling with our breakout room. Sorry, I went a little over there. Um, the role of museums and culture in the climate crisis. I've talked about this a lot already. What is our responsibility here? What is our role here? And do the ends justify the means? Are the values of culture more important than in, in the way that we're doing it now, more important than the carbon footprint that we're creating? For example, traveling exhibitions or shipping artworks around the world. Is that something that we should be doing? I don't know. Um, we know that climate, uh, that the cultural sector is engaging with issues of sustainability, especially climate crisis, um, from artworks to carbon, uh, or sorry, to uh, climate control changes and updates. It's really interesting for us to think about where we can make the biggest impact and how we want to use our voices to talk about sustainability and the climate crisis. Okay. And of course, we already talked about the climate activism aspect, and that's, I think, is an interesting part of this as well. All right. So now what I'd like to do is free up some room for discussion. I think, let's see, how many participants do we have? 17. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do is present the topics and present some questions, and then I'm going to open up the breakout rooms. Um, there will be four options. So please pick whichever one you would like to join. If we do have a situation where we have too few people in a breakout session, then we might close that one down or we might um, ask if someone wants to join that session. Um, but I'm gonna let you guys choose. So maybe have a number one pick and maybe a number two pick in mind. Um, and we'll be spending the next 40 minutes or so delving into these topics and your moderators will lead the discussions. So the first one is gonna be on carbon offsetting. Uh, the second group will be on climate activism. The third group is going to look at individual action and systems change. And the fourth group is going to look at the role of culture and museums in the climate crisis. So these are just some questions. Um, your moderators all have these questions. Uh, basically, looking at the carbon offsetting, we're going to look at, you know, talk about reactions to the clip that we saw. We'll talk a little bit about how we can compensate for the carbon that we contribute without paying for it, because we know that, especially in museums, budget is always an issue. Um, and I would love to delve into this idea of what we do for visitor travel. How do we how do we deal with the fact that people are flying from all over the world to come see our collections? Um, and is it important for us to reduce our carbon footprint? And why? Um, also, I'd love to you know circle in the greenwashing and green hushing aspect here. What are we at the most risk of? And of course, how do we talk about what we're doing without getting blamed for things that we're not doing so well? Group two is climate activism. So um, basically just posing questions about what do we think about this? Is it effective? Is it working? Is, you know, why are we doing, why are climate activist groups targeting cultural institutions? Um, and what do we think about the reaction of the cultural sector? How do we feel about how ICOM Germany has responded to this versus ICOM International? Um, what ways can we as museums support climate activism? Should we be activists? And of course, looking at, you know, this balance of being a space that contributes to climate change and also being a space that counteracts it. So also, of course, here, I think that there's some discussions about greenwashing and green hushing. So, you know, how public are institutions about their footprint and do we need to be more transparent about it? Um, and, you know, is it is it important for us to talk about these things and why or why not? Group three is uh, going to be looking at the individual action versus systems change. Um, and we're going to be looking at more or less like what is our role? What can we do? How, how much difference can one person make? And then thinking about, you know, how systems have changed in the past and can we drive that? Um, you know, what impact does an individual action make versus what impact do we have if we are uh, looking at systemic problems. So 
I would also like to invite people to share here impacts that they've had on the planet um, and things that they've done to reduce their carbon footprint or mitigate their waste and um, think a little bit about what hope looks like and um, what, a, what a sustainable future would be for the cultural sector. All right, and finally, group four is the role of museums in the climate crisis. So what is our role in this? What are our responsibilities? Can a museum ever truly be sustainable? It's a good question. Um, and then maybe we can share some examples of places we've seen sustainable action at museums, um, things that we're doing in our daily lives or in our jobs. And you know, if we could wave a magic wand, what would we like to do? What, how would we like to change? Welcome back, everyone. How were your breakout sessions? Interesting. Good. Awesome. I love the thumbs up. That's what we want to see. Brilliant. Um, so we have about nine minutes here. Um, I figured we could have a little shorter debriefing uh, since we had uh, only two groups, which is great because we actually have all of the same things to discuss. So I wanted to open up and um, hear about what you guys were discussing and uh, do some sharing and uh, reflecting. So maybe if I could start with uh, Lorena's group. I don't know who your presenter was. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Caitlin. So uh, I have volunteered to, uh, to, to, share, to share with, uh, with you what we discussed. Um, so I will try to be as brief as possible, uh, but I also ask my, my fellow, my colleagues, uh, to, 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 if, if they think I'm missing something really relevant, to drop a line in the chat or just, uh, yeah, feel free, feel free to uh to go to complete so uh yeah we had a very interesting discussion uh first we started discussing whether we uh, all believe uh that the cultural heritage sector and uh, museums but also in general glam and libraries archives uh and yeah uh, all institutions have a role to play we had uh, some participants from um Museum of Natural History in, in Greece, from Scotland as well, from IFLA. So I, I think we we all agree that our sector has a, a responsibility. We talked about uh, responsibility of tackling societal issues, which is uh, the case of climate change, and put it in, into an historic, uh, historic perspective. We also uh, spoke about having a public mission um and we also spoke about being a platform uh to reach out to communities uh to act also as an information hub so for example if you think of a library it's obviously the the, the most suitable place to uh share information and help people to understand uh, some of the of the challenges we are facing but also um as storytellers so we can uh, we can also spread the message in an inspiring way and help people. We are not talking about climate activists here, but people, uh, you know, children uh, or communities uh, to also take part in climate action. Um, so then we discussed how precisely we can uh, we can contribute uh, to, to this. Uh, yeah, to 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 lead a transformative climate action, we believe uh, that <clears throat> sorry, we should be role models and uh, walk the walk and talk the the talk. So to do this, we first need to ourselves, the cultural heritage professional, to better understand what's at stake. And here we see that there's a la lack of uh, guidance or overall lack of. Uh, let's say standards so there's no actual matrix that that can uh, guide our institutions to to be more sustainable so sharing good practices is a good uh, idea here we thought an eco label for museum for example collaboration with other actors with communities with creative industries uh with 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 NGOs. Um, so these are ways also to 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 uh, improve our uh, green performance. And uh, there are there is also an issue with the uh, 
sustainability of organizing exhibitions. Of course, there is a footprint when uh, flying, for example, exhibitions to other museums, but we also think uh, this, if you compare it to other industries, uh, it's just a drop in, in the bucket. And we need to also balance uh, the, uh, yeah, fulfilling our organizational mission on the one hand and sustainability targets on the other. So it's about shifting our minds, changing our priorities, and uh, design a new methodology that could help us achieve both. I'm coming to the end. Um, just uh, we discussed also a couple of very nice examples of how museums are already uh, engaging in the climate crisis from networking, for instance, through the Climate Heritage Network to creating, to using digital tools, uh, virtual reality, and uh, other immersive experience to uh, create awareness on the climate uh, crisis, to greening the, the infrastructure, so the building in itself, but also the digital infrastructure. Again, we here we discussed a lack of uh, standards in green coding, green data management, for example. So uh, just an addition from myself, uh, our community is working in this direction already. So I hope we can yeah, put our uh, grain of health in, in this regard. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you so much. Does anyone else from the group have anything that they would like to add? No? And you did a wonderful job of summarizing. So um, yeah, I, I think that's that's really fascinating. This kind of, I, I loved what you said about balance and indeed this idea of where is our biggest impact and information centers, but also practicing what we preach. And uh, as we can see, there's a lot of nuance here to the fulfilling our role and fulfilling our mission, but also doing both in a sustainable way. So that's that's absolutely brilliant. Um, I wanna make sure we have time for the for the second group. So um, Ava's group, I don't know who was gonna present. Yes, uh, I will be uh, the presenter of our group, uh, but uh, as uh, Lorena said, please, anyone from the group feeling that I'm missing an important point, especially you, Marco, since you are not taking, uh, please jump in. Uh, I felt uh, as long as I we were uh, hearing to Lorena's uh, summary, uh, a lot of uh, our group's points kind of clicking to that. Um, so uh, we also started by discussing uh, what uh, is the um, cultural sector's uh, role. And um, all of us uh, expressed our, um, let's say, uh, personal uh, uh, uncomfortableness <laughs> of not really knowing uh, what's the role of uh, a museum in uh, climate section. We, in climate uh, crisis, uh, we did uh, share our thoughts on uh, climate sector in general that can be, uh, that can showcase uh, questions, uh, can put uh, diversity out, um, can uh, have art or artists themselves as bridges in translating uh, those climate crisis questions into something that we can uh, grasp as uh, cultural uh, professionals. Uh, however, there is a big black hole of how are we uh, measuring our uh, carbon footprint? Uh, what are the boundaries of uh, the system we are taking into uh, when we want to measure something? Uh, how does this translate? Uh, with the whole uh, digital transformation endeavor. Uh, and can we combine sustainability with digitization? Um, so it was more of posing uh, and putting out there uh, some very um, thought provoking uh, questions. Um, of course, we also had a representation from the cultural sector's side. Um, with a professional uh, from the Natural History Museum from uh, uh, Switzerland. And um, we um, uh, we kind of close our discussion by saying, by saying, or maybe by realizing that we don't, as um, museums or professionals, professionals in uh, cultural sector, we don't really um, kind of uh, have 
um, directions on sustainability imposed on us. Uh, however, uh, we um, kind of uh, trying to navigate uh, the landscape uh, by our let's say um like by collect our collections itself let's say the the quality or uh, the diversity of our collections um or by uh, creating narratives uh and sharing stories um to that direction um essentially um yeah uh, kind of sorry let me take a look at my notes yeah, essentially, we can uh, achieve better awareness uh, by sharing um, different perspectives through our uh, collections. Uh, we can relate to different realities. Um, of course, there was a point of uh, realizing hmm, maybe museums should become activists. Should we take a more concrete action toward climate crisis or sustainability? Or to what degree uh, do we, we want as cultural sector to present uh, these collections, ideas or perspectives? Let's say, what is the margin of um, action that museums can actually take? Um, so there is, again, an issue of balance of not really having a clear guidance, but having the museums being eager to take on action. Uh, we don't really have someone to tell museums what to present or pursue, but we do have a uh, society uh, looking up to museums for reference points or for guidance. Um, so yes, museums can be drivers of sustainability uh, since they have this power of creating narratives. I would say that this was, let's say, the concluding point of our uh, discussion. Um, sorry if it was a bit messed up. Uh, it wasn't that well structured as Lorena's. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, that's the beauty in. of it is, you know, it's these discussions flow in different directions. It's a squiggly path. So I, th I think you illustrated that beautifully. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, Marco, please. I just wanted to add uh, something that I have in my notes. Uh, it's a quote. I won't say I won't say who said what, but we were talking about digitizing and uh, the digitization, the, this paradox. And someone was saying, "Yes, we are digitizing for the future future generation." And someone else said, "If there will be future generations." So there was a quote in our in our discussion. Really interesting. That's such a good point. That's such a good point. I love how how deep we went there. That's brilliant. <laughs> Does anyone else from um, either of the groups actually have anything else that they'd like to share or reflect upon or add? No? Okay, sounds good. Well, I know we're just a little over time, um, but I just wanted to, you know, first of all, thank you all for your courage to uh, have these discussions. I know that sometimes these are difficult topics and um, can feel a little bit strange to unpack, but um, I hope that you feel a little bit more comfortable talking about these things. And I would like to use this as an opportunity to invite you to continue these discussions. Um, talk to your colleagues about this, talk to your peers, talk to your friends, talk to your families. Um, you know, I think it's the more we talk about this, the more normalized the conversation becomes and the more uh, we can bring awareness to finding solutions. So um, I, I hope that you you feel empowered to continue these dialogues and uh, and and continue questioning what we do and what our role is and how we can help to procure a future where there's no question of if there are generations. So I think that's a, that's a beautiful place to end. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining today. It was a huge pleasure to have you and a huge thank you to our amazing moderators, to Lorena and Marco and Ava, and also of course to Tamara for her excellent help support. Um, and we also have our final session, which Patrick and I will be hosting. Hey, Patrick, nice to see you, um, which is going to focus on digital. So I know we talked a little bit about digital today and I'm hoping that, uh, excuse me, you'll come back and join us for the next session to dive deeper into that specific topic. Um, and uh, Lorena will be uh, distributing information about that everywhere, but you can also find the link in the chat. Thank you, tomorrow. 
Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Um, I will give you guys all access to the PowerPoint presentation, which has a bunch of links in there and some good questions. And I hope that you take those questions back and start posing them not only to yourself, but to your peers and colleagues and uh, looking forward to continuing discussions. So thank you all for being here. Have a lovely rest of your afternoon.